Hello, I want to welcome you to today's uh, lecture. Uh, today we'll be looking at a follow-up to the last lecture in our module 4. This will be the second lecture in module 4. Um, today we'll be looking at nomenclature of ionic compounds. So we're going to understand what ionic compounds are, how they are formed, and including how to name them correctly and including the classes of ionic compounds. Let's take it off as usual. We're going to see the quote in my lecture. The quote says, self-doubt is the genius killer. The quote by Robin Schirmer. There is always uh, an issue with self-doubt. The best thing you can do for yourself is to be self-confident in your abilities. Even when you are trying and failing, if you can trust yourself implicitly and work harder, you're gonna get there so i just said let me share this quote with you before we start the classes okay our learning goals for today will be number one we're going to understand how ionic compounds are formed of course we will also predict how ions are formed when these ionic compounds are made and then we will correctly name and write the formulas of all classes of ionic compounds this will be our three learning goals in this class. Let's take it off. Ionic bond formation. You see, ionic bonds earlier in module one, we were able to talk about ions are formed. Of course, um, ionic compounds are those compounds that are formed between a metal and a non metal. That's really the best generic, generic definition of an ionic compound. Now, what happens in that process? Usually, in that process, a metal loses an electron which is gained by a non-metal and in, in such a case both of them form ions now both atoms of course the reason why they do this is that both of atoms are actually changed to the ions which will have the same electronic configuration as those of the noble gas remember the noble gases want to are very stable every other element want to look like them want to have eight electrons in the atomic shell that is still what we call the octet rule if we remain by that the octet rule now the resulting ions are attracted to each other of course when these ions are formed of course they form positive positive is the cation of course and then the negative is the anion and what do you expect there will be attraction between a positive and a negative and that attraction of course is what uh, we call an ionic bond that is what we call an ionic bond it's a very in fact if not one of the strongest uh, intra-atomic bonds now the ions with positive charges of course the cations are attracted to the ions with negative charge and this attraction is or this force of attraction is what we call an electrostatic or electrovalent or ionic bond now of course those ions will attract together of course the best in every type of bond formation there's always this ability for different polarities to attract each other and in this case that attraction is maximum in ionic compound now so what type of electronic transfer, transfer process actually takes place when ionic compounds are formed. You see, if we look at the periodic table, in our last module we talked about how we can predict the ions formed by, by um, elements, representative elements, those elements from group 1a, group 2a, group 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, and 7a. And we said we can easily know that how much electrons they will gain or lose by knowing which group they belong to so we can use the periodic table to predict that number of the number of electrons that is either lost or gained by an atom through ionic bond formation we can easily use this to do that so a good example now lithium of course belongs in group one and group one element again i will always advise you if you're listening to this lecture what you need to do for yourself is to have your pencil or pen and your jota or your notes 
and then have your periodic table and your calculator by your side anytime you want to listen to my lecture. That will help you to take down notes. Now, lithium belongs to group one, of course, in the periodic table. What it simply means is that lithium will have one electron in the atomic shell, and the Lewis structure of lithium, like we did in the previous model, will be lithium with one dot. What it simply means is that because lithium has one electron in the atomic shell, it has the ability to lose this one electron and then we'll, we'll have nothing remaining at that most shell. And in that process, it will acquire a positive charge. And this is the electron it has lost. So this is the simple electron, tra electron transfer process that takes place here. So now what happens is that, in then what happens when the atom is an anion? A good example again is phosphorus. Phosphorus is in group 5. Of course, it's going to have 5 electrons in the outermost shell. So now I have five electrons. You see it here. We've counted out one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Now against three electrons, of course, if we want to determine the charges of this element, we said it earlier, for this for, for non-metals, you're going to do the group number minus five. So using group five, if you do five, just as a reminder, if you do five minus eight, that'll give you three minus, and that is how we know the charge. However, what that simply means is that it needs three more electrons for the valence shell to fill. And when we write the Lewis structure, this is what we're going to be forming at the end of the We'll be having a phosphorus ion who has eight electrons in the outermost shell. And now, these two guys, of course, will now attract each other to form what we call an ionic bond. And because both of the form ionic bond, of course, ionic bonds are formed in ionic compounds. This is important. Who know this in ionic compounds? So moving on to the next uh, page, let's do some problems here. Let's do some problems. Remember, the more problems you do, the more confident you get, and the easier for you to answer these questions as you see them, either in your textbooks or when you are reading on your own. So it's write an equation to present the electron transfer process when the following elements form ion. Again, if we're going to represent the electron transfer process, that involves the loss of electron by a metal and the gain of electron by a non-metal. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to keep your periodic table by the side. Potassium is in group one of the periodic table. What that simply means is that potassium will have just one electron in the atomic shell. I already told you in the previous module that for metals, the electrons are written, the electrons and the ions, the cation is written at the other side of the arrow. So what that simply means is that potassium is going to lose this electron. And in that process, it's going to form potassium 1 plus because it's in group 1. And this electron is lost. So this is the electron transfer process that will take place. What about magnesium? Magnesium is in group 2. It will have how many dots? Two dots. What that simply means is that magnesium is going to lose two electrons and that process will form a two plus charge, of course, plus two electrons. Now, taking that to a non metal, again, nitrogen is a non metal, it belongs to group five of the periodic table. Now, for us, group five, again, what that tells us is that it will have five electrons. So let's count one, two, three, four, five. And it has to gain extra three electrons for you to have a complete octet of eight. And that is, of course, you can write it either the full way. If you're going to write it in the full way, it's going to be, you're going to put eight dots around it. And then you're going to have a charge of three minus. Or you can just say N three minus. Because when we're going to be writing the formulas of compound, we're just going to write it as N three minus. We're going to be showing these electrons. The next page, the same question, we'll still use the periodic table again. Selenium belongs in group C of the periodic table. Selenium has six electrons. We'll now make our four cardinal points. Four, we still have, this will be five, and this is going to be six. I don't think that that one looks to be close to each other. Okay. So we count one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, selenium has to gain two electrons because it's in group C to form the selenium ion. Again, I like laying this emphasis. You can always put all your dots until you get conversant 
with how this is drawn. Some other people will even like to put the bracket. It doesn't really matter to me. So, or you can just say selenium 2 minus. Bromine, again, bromine is in group 7. We're going to have 7 dots. 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll put another one, 5, 6, and 7. What it means, you need one more dot for the, for you to get 8 electrons in that more shell. And that we're going to have bromine now. It's going to be 8 dots around itself. And then, of course, because it's in group 7, it just needs only one electron. So the charge is going to be 1 minus, or you can say Br minus. And the last we have there, but not the least, is aluminum. Aluminum is in group 3. It's a metal, of course. Metals are going to what? Lose electrons. And because it's in group 3, we're going to have 3 dots around it. And what it means is that it's going to lose 3 electrons to form a plus 3 charge. The number of electrons it has in its atomic shell is exactly what it's going to lose for it to form an ion. So this is how we can represent the electron transfer process. Because for this uh, for these atoms, of course, to form ionic compound, they need to undergo this loss again of electrons and form this ion, so these charges that will bring about that attraction. So what is now ionic compound? Ionic compounds are just the consequences of ion an ionic bond. So the substances that are formed when ionic bonds form between the positive ion, of course, the cation, and the negative ion, which is an anion. Now, and there are different ways we can classify any compounds, but to make it to, to, for convenience, I'm going to bring this classification because that will help us in naming any compound because that will be the major thing we're going to be getting into very soon. So, now, there are two types of ionic compounds in this case. We'll call the binary. Binary compounds contain only two elements. Of course, every ionic compound will have an element and a non-metal. So we have not an element, a metal and a non-metal, I mean to say, sorry for that. Now, so we have a metal and a non-metal. So what that simply means is that we have two stuff making it up, just two atoms making it up, two atoms making it up. Now, on the other hand, the ternary ionic compounds are compounds that contain more than two. Of course, this is the key word, contains more, more than two elements of course one of the elements must be a metal and then a non-metal so now this is very interesting because in tenor ionic compound most of the things you see you're not going to be seeing like three elements just ordinarily combined together you're going to be seeing mainly a metal and a polyatomic ion a polyatomic ion is an ion uh that contains an ion that contains more than one element we call them polyatomic ion they are single entities just like a good example is like soft sulfate is a single entity that is charged negative two minus so when you meet sulfate with a metal you find out that you have three elements in this compound and this is what you call a ternary ionic compound and ionic compound have some interesting properties we're going to talk about uh, it is not in this chapter for us to begin to look at their deep properties. But part of the thing we need to highlight is this, that, that most of them usually form high boiling and melting point solids. They have high boiling and melting point. They are high boiling and melting point substances. Most of them are soluble in water because they are ionized. They form positive and negative charges. But because water is a polar substance, it has the ability to mainly dissolve a lot of this ionic compound. And lastly, now, they are good conductors of heat and electricity. They are good, very good conductors of heat and electricity. In fact, you can just say they are electrolyte as well. So that's a very good one if you want to just use that word instead. Now, let's start coming to close to naming and writing formulas of ionic compound. The formula you need of ionic compound. Of course, ionic compounds are not covalent compounds. And therefore, we use the word formula unit to, 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 to talk about their particles. A formula unit. That's always the word we use for them. Formula unit of ionic compound. So, the formula unit of ionic compound actually represents an electron transfer process that takes place between 
a metal and another metal when they react ionically like we sh I showed you in the previous slides. Now the idea usually here is to do an, a little bit of an algebra whereby the positive and negative charges we cancel out. The positive and negative charges we cancel out. So at the end of the day, the element becomes electrically neutral. And there are many ways we can do this. One of the simple ways we can do this is what I usually call the strength, the crisscross method, whereby the charges are swapped, or you can balance the charges. So in this case, what I simply mean here is swapping of the charges. Another author might call it any name. Swap it. They can swap their charges or exchange their charges. Whereas the balancing of charges will be like using a little bit of algebra to do balance of charge and make sure. Since they're going to be electrical, what it simply means is that whenever you add the charges of ionic compound, it must give you zero. So if you add the charges of ionic compound gives zero. That is what we mean by electrical neutrality. That's what we mean by electrical neutrality. That's what we mean by electrical neutrality. So let's see a very good example here. So if magnesium reacts, so I'm going to do two, I'm going to try to get some space to do two. So the first thing I'm going to do, magnesium is in group two. So that tells me that what charge is it going to form? It has a constant charge of, let's say, magnesium is two plus. Now, fluorine is in group seven. What is the charge on fluorine? Fluorine will be F minus. If I want to write the formula or the formula unit of this compound, like I said, using the crisscross method, I'm going to swap these charges. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take this one here, pretend as if I did not see the sign, because the signs do not come. The atoms will become electrical neutral. I'm going to transfer this sign, this, sorry, the number, the magnitude to magnesium. So it's going to be mg1, and I'm going to put it as a subscript. When once you are forming this compound as ionic compound, the charges has to, the, the numbers, the transfer of those charges, you neglect the charges, plus or minus, and put the magnitude of this number, the value of this number, as a subscript. Now, what that simply means is that this magnitude has to, it's going to give this two to this guy, so you're going to put that as a subscript. And then what it means is that if you combine them together, the compound you form will have a formula of MgF2, and this will be the correct formula of magnesium of magnesium fluoride. We're not naming it first. So let us let me use the balancing of uh, the balancing method. You see, I usually take students. I want to take this off. I hope you already wrote this down. I'm going to try to take that off. My eraser. Now, if I usually don't like cleaning a lot when I when I do lecture because I believe that this annotation helps students. But like I said, I will always advise you to always try to take down notes when you're doing this that helps a lot okay now if i'm going to do balancing method let me try to balance my charges so what do i do again the first thing you still need to realize we've established the fact that the charges on this let me use a different color the charges the charge of magnesium is two plus and the charge of this is one minus go back to my red so having known that what it simply means is that i'm going to balance if i want to balance the charges what am i going to do the charges is going to be now I'm going to write my magnesium here. Of course, it's going to be two plus. I'm going to write my fluorine minus. Remember, it says that the idea is to balance out these charges and make it electrically neutral. What it means is that it has to be equal to zero. My idea is to make this charge to be equal to zero. So I'm going to draw a line here. I will bring this down. So I have two plus here. Of course, for me to make this to be zero, that means I need two of these to make it zero. What that simply means is that I'm going to multiply this by 2. Since I have 2 here, I'm going to have 2 here. So what it means is that I'm going to need 2 of these to make this 2. So if I add another one here, what it means, plus 1 minus, plus 1 minus will give me what? Negative 2. So what it simply means is that 2 plus minus 2 is going to give me what? 0. And if you add this thing together, F plus F will be 2. So you put it together, this is going to give you magnesium. You now put this together, F plus S will give you F2. 
you cannot say f2 minus that would be wrong so it has to be a subscript and this is all mean by balancing uh, the charges so whichever one that works for you or that you are more conversant with you can easily use it and at the point you find out that you are now been so competent that you don't even need to do those balancing you can easily do this offer okay let's do this problem say so what are the formula you need for the ionic compounds formed between the pair of the flowing ions of course the first thing you need to do is to write these ions write this these are neutral atoms write them as the ions and use their group number to determine these charges as we did previously so potassium is in group one it has to be k plus what it means it has to combine with this again what do you do you can use any method that works for you if you transfer these charges now those ones that have equal charges are easy to balance because when you do plus if you do is easy if you do plus one minus one gives you zero no need to even transfer the charges again because if you transfer it's going to give you one so you're going to easily form a compound that is kcl now let's get to this now for this one again sodium is in group one so the charge has to be plus one phosphorus is more group you look at the periodic table it is what period it is in group five it has, has to have the charge of <coughs> excuse me negative three what do we do we swap the charges that would be easy to do so now you take this three and give it the sodium if you give it to sodium, sodium will be Na3 as a subscript. Now you take this one and give it to phosphorus. Of course, everything one, you don't need to write it, this is P1. If you combine this together, it's going to give you Na3P. That is the correct formula for this ionic compound. <clears throat> Again, we come to magnesium and nitrogen. Now, magnesium is in group 2. What that means is that the charge is going to form will be 2 plus, Mg2 plus. Nitrogen is in group five to have a charge of three minus again what do we do we just swap the charges again that's the best thing to do here we swap the charges if you swap this charge if this goes to this and this goes to this let's see so what is going to be if i take this straight to this guy okay you can always do this arrow you should have to help yourself out so magnesium will take the three of nitrogen and nitrogen will take the two of magnesium and when you combine these two together you have mg three and two and this will be the correct formula of this compound formed from magnesium and nitrogen now we have no it's usually good to solve a lot of problems to make yourself really very competent and used to be so let's stay the same thing what are the formula you need for the ionic compound formed between the pair of the following elements or ions so what do we do calcium is in group two again it's going to form two plus charge selenium is in group six it's going to form what charge group six will gain two electrons so their charges are going to be two minus if you swap the charge see, plus two negative two will cancel out so no need even to do the swapping so what you simply need is to cancel it out and write c a s e calcium selenide most times students write the compound for me and they also put the charges remember this these compounds when they form ionic compound this element or rather this or this element that will form ions and then that will result to ionic compound when they form they are electrically neutral you don't have to put the charges anymore doing that is a bad practice again let's look at aluminum and oxygen aluminum is in group three again if you look at your predictable to have three plus charge oxygen is in group two you to have two minus charge if we swap this again now aluminum gets the two from oxygen oxygen gets the three from aluminum and when you combine those together it's going to form al 2 3 and finally the last but not the least sodium and phosphorus sodium is in group one it's going to form one plus phosphorus is in group three if we swap these charges again or balance which whichever case okay let me use the balancing to do this one I'm going to use balancing to do this one. I'm going to use balancing to do this one because if I if I do if I do them that way, it tends to be easy. So I'm going to use balancing to actually do this one. I'm going to remove my line and use the balance. So mixing it up helps the students to gain confidence and choose which one. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to say plus and I'm going to do P3 minus. Now, I'm going to balance this. What I'm going to do is how many of these am I going to add to balance this? This has one plus. What do you mean? If I add, look, of course, this is 3 minus. For me to balance this, I need 3. What it means is I'm going to add 3 of this guy. It is 2 now. I'm going to add another one. It is 3. So if you add all of them together, they're going to give you 3 plus. So what that means is that if you combine this thing together, you have 3 atoms of sodium and of course only one atom of phosphorus. And that is the formula of the compound formed from sodium and potassium. The actual compound is actually called sodium phosphide, but we're going to do this nomenclature as we move on. Then, another another thing we're going to be doing here is solving more problems. You see, if you look at this, the, if you look at these ones, look at what we have here. That will interest you. You see, um, it says, what are the formula you need for the following compound form from the following ions as well? Now, I've been using elemental ions, but we've been having the elements written. Now, we're going to see a mix of both the elements and the ion. Now, let's do this one. This one is like the other ones we did before. Now, SR is thrown to me in group 2, so it's going to form SR2+. Plus. And then BR is in group what? BR is in group 7. It's going to have only one minus. So what that simply means is that when both of these guys come together, they're going to swap this. So this one here, we go for strontium. You don't have to put it. And these two, we go to bromine. So you're going to have S, R, B, R, O, 2. Now, you see, for these two, I had to put their charge. The reason why I put their charge is that these two elements, if you look at them, let me try to share them a little bit. This element, vanadium and chromium, belong to the transition element. They form variable charges. So I'm not just going to say V or CR. That would be confusing because the charges need to be specified. So this is easy. What we simply need to do here is to swap their charges. Here, oxygen is always two. The, the, the anions have a constant charge. It's never variable. It's only the metals that we have some that have some variability in there. Now, what is it going to be? Here, we're going to, I'm going to take these two for vanadium. Vanadium acquires the two from oxygen and oxygen acquires the five from vanadium. And this is what it's going to form. Again, in this one, chromium, this is a good one. I'm going to show you something here. Chromium here will acquire two from sulfide. And sulfide is going to acquire what? Four from chromium. Now, if you leave this as your answer, you are wrong. I know you're going to be surprised. Why? Remember we said earlier that you have to. It will be the minimum number that can cancel themselves in Ionic, writing ionic compounds will do a little bit of algebra. So you have to simplify it. If you see a, a formula that can simplify itself, you have to simplify it. So simplifying this means that 2 can divide 4. And that simply gives us CR. 2 divided will give you 1. And solve 4. So if you divide this by 2 and you divide this by 2, it's going to give you CR1 and S2. And this is the correct formula of this compound. So the idea here is that you have to simplify it. And this only, you have to simplify. And this is only the case of ionic compound. You cannot do this in covalent compounds. Now, aluminum and bromide and bromine. Aluminum is in group 3, has 3 plus charge. Bromine is in group 7 has BR1 minus. If they swap their charges again, or well, aluminum gets 1 from this guy, I don't need to show it, and bromine gets 3 from aluminum, so we're going to have this compound. So these are ways you can easily write the formulas of this compound, either when you have the elements themselves, or when you have the charges themselves. And we're going to be applying this knowledge directly into naming binary ionic compounds. So that's what we're going to name in binary ionic compounds. How do we name binary ionic compounds. You see, binary ionic compounds typically form when a metal and a non-metal react. We've established that fact. Now, the thing that happens is that I usually say that the metal is the head of this element. The metal name is given first in the formula. And then 
Of course, remember that the formula for binary compound represents the minimum number of each ion, the minimum. That's why you have to simplify. That will provide equal number of positive and negative electrical charges when combined together. So to write the formula unit when given the name too, if you have the name I want to write the formula unit, usually what you do is to use the reverse crisscross method. We're going to see how that plays out as I take into the steps. So what are the rules we're going to use? So now, rule the first one we're going to call is usually called, which some people call it type 1. Type 1 are those that have fixed charges. Ionic compound that have fixed charges. And these fixed charges are those of them that belong in group 1A, group 2A, and group 3A. So these guys, of course, the binary, this binary ionic compound, of course, they have a metal and non-metal, but those metals have to be between group 1A, group 2A, and group 3A. So what do we do? What is the rule? One, the cation name is always given first. You have to say it full. And then the anion name comes second. Now, a simple cation takes its name from the name of the element. So if you have sodium, you're just going to say sodium. It doesn't change. This is sodium ion. You just call it sodium. And then for the anions, anion name, the name is changed. What happens? The simple ion is named by taking the first, we take the first part of them, which we call the root, and adding the end in IDE. So if I want to name, let's say oxygen. Look at what happens here. I'm going to be dropping this. And if I drop this, I'm going to have, I'm going to add IDE. So this oxide ion simply means O2 minus. So that is how we're going to name this. So we're going to apply this knowledge in some naming examples. Let's see what. So common monatomic ions you're going to see are these ones that I have here. So the common monatomic ions that are very common will be, like I said again, you're going to figure out these ones from their group number. Lithium, sodium, potassium. These are all you notice this one. So if you look at these first few ones, potassium, uh, sodium, lithium, cesium are in group one. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and strontium and barium are in group two. They have two plus charge. Now aluminum and gallium also in group three. Rubidium is in group one. Hydrogen is in group one as well. Hydrogen can also form this particularly in acid. Then for the anions, hydrogen can also form an anion in this case. It can also share electron or rather gain an electron. So it's going to form the hydride ion. For fluorine is fluoride, chlorine is chloride, bromine is bromine, ion is iodide, oxygen is oxide, sulfur is sulfide, and all the rest of that. So we're going to apply this just in naming some of these problems. So it says, name the following binary ionic compound. Remember the rule first. The name of the cation is given first. So now the name of this element here is potassium. So we're going to write it first. This is the cation call it is potassium potassium and the name of the anion is now given second this anion is oxygen now but we're going to drop the oxygen and put id we're going to drop the last part and put ide so if we put that the name of this ion when oxygen forms ion is called oxide so the name of this compound is oxide potassium oxide now again we go to this one Magnesium, name the first element, which is the metal will be given full magnesium. Now, this is nitrogen. Remember, let's, let's write, this is nitrogen. Now, nitrogen, name, will be dropped. We're going to be dropping from here to here. And we're going to replace it with ID. So, at the end of the day, the name of this compound will be magnesium nitride. Again, gallium and this guy. So gallium, again, has a constant charge. Gallium, we're going to be naming sulfur. So it's going to be, I'm not going to be writing it again, it's going to be sulfide. And then aluminum here. Aluminum, AL is aluminum, when you look at it. Alu, aluminum. Then bromine is going to form an ion. And how do we name that ion? It's going to be bromide. Bromide, and that is how we name this compound. So if you go to the next page, you can also, you can pause this video now since we've done the first page and show you how to name this, and then try to name this yourself, and then come back to the video and check it for comprehension and correctness. So you write the formula 
of the following compounds. Again, now we're going to go from the formula to the name. Remember, look at this place. We went from the formula to the name. Now we're doing the opposite. Like I said, you can use the reverse crisscross method. You use use reverse crisscross method. That's what I said earlier to do this. You can use different other ways. So what do we do? The first thing you need to do is to write the formula of the ions individual form. Sodium is in group one. It's going to form sodium plus. Selenium, selenide is from selenium. It's in group six. It's going to form Se2 minus. So we want to write the formula of this compound. It's just like what we did the first time. What do you do? We'll be joining them together. So we're going to swap their signs. If you swap these signs again, these two is going to go to sodium. And this is going to go, this one here is going to go to selenium. And what do we have? We now have, when you swap those charges, it's going to give you Na2, because these two goes to sodium. And Se1, you don't need to show the 1. So this is the formula for this compound. Again, barium and natra. Barium is again is in group two. We write it. Barium will form a charge of two plus. Nitride we form is in group five. So it's going to form a charge of N by minus. N three minus. Now again, you swap these charges. So you take this and give it to this guy and take this and give to this guy. So what are we going to have here when you do that? Now, BA will take the three. We have N we take what the two and this is the formula of the compound form from this to compound now we have strontium oxide strontium is in group two sr is in group two so you're going to get the formula from the periodic table just know that now sr is two plus and then oxygen is two minus because it's in group six it has to gain two electrons so what that simply means is that the charges are already equal look at it when the charges are equal what you simply need to do is to bring down the formula of without the charge without the charge so we're going to say sr oh, so that will be the formula to compound again aluminum and iodine and iodine of course aluminum is in group three it's going to form three plus iodine is in group seven it's going to form one minus of course the name of the iodine ion is called iodide ion so when we swap these charges this three we go to this iodine one we go to aluminum so aluminum takes one you don't have to show that three goes to iodine this becomes i three that is the formula for aluminum iodide and in fact you have to stick to the main formula or the main formula of the element the way it is represented in a periodic table so if i had written this aluminum as a small letter a l that is not aluminum that becomes very wrong and so some students do do it in the exam and i usually tell them you have to stick to the real identity of this element because changing those will simply be changing what the element looks like so binary compounds with variable charges now remember we talked about this earlier those of them that have what it simply means is that now elements in the inner transition and transition will usually have more than one charge the form of the one charge so some metals especially those of the transition and the inner transition what well, simply means the d block okay we did this earlier this is the d block and the f block they usually form more than one type of charged ion what does simply mean a good example is copper here i have this example copper forms both copper two ion and copper one ion what it simply means is that if you say copper which one are you referring to you have to be specific what is the rule the number of the positive charge is indicated in Roman numeral and in parentheses. You have to put it in Roman numeral and put a bracket there. So what that simply means is that if copper interacts with chlorine to form a, an ionic compound, it's simply going to be if it is copper 2, it's going to form copper 2 chloride, CuCl2. If it is 1 plus, it's going to form copper 1 chloride. So the compound CuCl2 and CuCl1 contain both copper ions with plus two charge and plus one charge respectively. So what will be the name? This one is going to be, look at the name, copper two chloride. You need to show and then copper one chloride. So the main difference here is this 
Roman numeral and the parenthesis that's included to indicate the specific charge of this group of compounds. We're going to practice this in the previous, in the in the next page. So it's a name the following compound. Of course, these are compounds, a compound that are made from the variable uh, metals, metals with different charge. So the, what do you do first? Now, the best thing I test you, the best way to figure this out is to also use your balancing method. That helps. Now, the charges of the anions do not change. The charges of the anions do not change. That's where you start from. So what do you do? In solving these problems, I don't know the charge of this guy because I have to put the charge. But I know that sulfur has a charge of what? 2 plus. Right? So that's easy. So let me say, let me write it here. CR. I know sulfur has a charge of 2 plus and I have two atoms here. What that simply means is that there is 2 plus and there are 2 atoms of chromine here. It's not chromine. So 2 atoms of sulfur here. So if I want to balance that charge, what it means is that if I add the total number of charge it has here, it will be 4 plus charge. And since it has 4 plus charge, how many charges do I need to balance off this guy to be 0? Remember, ionic charges must equal to 0. It has to be equal to 0. If I call this x and solve for it, it simply means that my this has to be what? Oh, oh and this I think there's a mistake there. I saw it. So this is minus, sorry. So this is wrong. This is wrong. Just don't be carried away. Sorry for the mistake. So this is 2 minus and 2 minus. When I add them, it gives me 4 minus. Now simply what that means for me to cancel negative 4. I need positive 4 to cancel it to 0. What that simply means is that this must be 4 will be 4 in each charge. So if it is 4, if I now know that charge of this is 4 now. So I know so the charge of this is plus 4. So to name this element now is going to be chromium. You now put in parentheses what is the charge? 4. It has to be in Roman numeral is IV for 4. So 5. This is how we name this kind of compound. In my experience as a teacher, naming ionic compound with variable charges is usually where the students struggle very much. And I do believe that watching this video is going to help you navigate the difficult. Again, we come back to this one. Here we have manganese. Manganese, we don't know what it is yet. We want to find out. But we know oxygen is 2 minus. It's constant. And how many atoms do we have here? We have 3. So let's write it. It's going to be 2 minus, another O, 2 minus, another O. 2 minus. If I'm going to balance this chart, I'm going to have 6 minus here. This gives me 0. So what that means is that I need a 6 plus here to balance this. So this is going to be plus 6 plus. So the name of this compound has to be charge of 6 then. So we're going to call it, this is, if you look at MN from periodic table, it is called, this is called manganese manganese of course the charge is six oxygen is named as oxide so you see this is very interesting to to figure this out if you can always work out this balance that helps you to navigate through this again we do this again here we have tc and n3 but one of them one one atom it makes it easy now, if you have, we know our TC, we don't know what it is, but we know that our nitride is always minus. And then we have to balance, it's one atom. So that means three minus, we come down. For you to balance three minus, it has to be a plus three. So this is eventually be three plus. So for it, for us to name this, it's going to be technetium. Technetium three nitride. And the last but not the least, let's look at this one. MO simply means molybdenum. Molybdenum is number 42 in the periodic table. Atomic number 42, molybdenum. So molybdenum, now phosphorus has a charge. We know the charge of phosphorus. Phosphorus has how many charges? 3 minus. But how many phosphorus do we have here? 2. So what it means is the total of phosphorus charge here is going to give us 6 minus. What it means my molybdenum has to be 6 plus to cancel it out. So what it simply means is that we're going to have an element named molybdenum. 
bednum 6 vi phosphide this is phosphorus we call it a phosphide okay now i'm gonna make this to fit in it has to fit in it has to fit in somehow yeah it has to fit in molybdenum phosphide oh i have a space down here i can just write it down okay you can just write my phosphide here sorry for that i have some space and i'm trying to fit it there all right the next problem we continue now having known how to write these formulas how do we now use these ones and convert them back to their formula so we want to write the formula unit of this guy this is easy the writing the formula unit of variable compound is easier I usually tell students that why the reason why it's easier is because if you look at this the charges is already stated so it's already stated so it's easier for you here this is fe3 plus ion 3 chloride and we know chlorine is always what one minus what do you do again we have to just transfer the charges this three goes to chlorine this one goes to ion so what are we going to have it's going to be fe you don't have to say the one but chlorine gets the three here so this is the formula for ion three chloride again here we do the same thing manganese is mn and the charge here is what four plus and oxygen we know is what two minus again what do we do we swap the charges if you swap the charges manganese gets two from oxygen and then oxygen gets four from manganese and what that tells us is that now remember again we we're back to this again these two can simplify so what it simply means if you can simplify for any compound you have to do that when you simplify this it has to be mn1 you don't put the one again in o Two, and this is the correct formula for manganese for oxide chromium two sulfide again we come cr two plus sulfide of course in group six is two plus so this one is easy because the charges are equal we just bring down this so it's going to be cr gold three phosphide let's see gold is au in the periodic table if you look at it three plus phosphide is in group five so it's going to be three three minus if you look at this the charges are equal so basically they're going to cancel out easily so you're going to have a u p that will be the formula of good three phosphide now always feel free to pause these videos practice these problems and always come back to them i will always advise that to happen we go to the next class of this ionic compound now we're getting uh, almost done with the class now, tenere ionic compound, of course, we said it earlier, they contain more than two elements. Now, what are the rules? The rules are basically the same, but the difference now is that we have to name the polyatomic ion. These polyatomic ions have a name, particularly those polyatomic anions have their particular name. So the rules for naming these compounds are essentially the same for us of the banner, but what are the peculiarities? Of course, usually we put the metal first, as usual, followed by the name of the polyatomic ion. So the name of the metal comes first, then you now name the polyatomic ion. Again, the positive and negative charge has to cancel to be zero. This is constant, like we did before. Now, parentheses or brackets are used around the polyatomic ion when you when they contain more than one. What I simply means, okay, let me write an example. So if I'm going to say magnesium nit nit nitrate what this simply means is that for this to balance this is two plus this has to be two because this is initially one minus you have to put two here that's all i mean so if you're going to put more than one one and one entity of polyatomic ion you have to use a bracket around them to represent them as a single unit and then finally charges for metals with variable charges has to be shown those metals that have variable charges again you have to put it in parentheses as we did for the binary ionic compounds and then let's take it off so if you look at this list this list contain common polyatomic ions in use and it is your responsibility to memorize this ionic compound for your exams however in my worksheet i cover those area, those ones you need to memorize specifically for the exam but for practice i will advise you to try to read as many as you can and memorize them and use them to practice for yourself so let's take the examples of now, the first thing I have there, if you look at the first thing I have there, I have, now, the first thing, we have to name the metal first. So here, 
calcium is in group two. It is not, it's not a variable metal. It's not a metal with variable charge. So we put the name first. We say the name. It will be calcium. We have to say the name. The next thing, what is the name of this? If you look at that, if you go back to this and look at the name of that guy, let's, let's look at it. Since we're just starting, I'm going to show you. If you look at that, PO4, 3 minus, what is the name? Let's look for the name. The name is going to be, if you look at here, PO4, 3 minus is called phosphate. Let's go back to the slide where we have it. So it's going to just going to be calcium phosphate. In fact, I test trend, even naming these ones is far more easy. Just say the name of the anion, what you see. So it's calcium phosphate. Again, let's name this one. This is gallium. Gallium is in group 3. So it has a constant charge. We don't need to think about the charge. It's gallium. And then, now if you look at NO3 minus, look at what element, what polyatomic ion is that. You go look at it again. This is called the nitrate. So we go back. So what do we do? We put it. It's going to be gallium nitrate. Something happens here. Now, you see, copper is, has a variable charge, iron has a variable charge. So we have to specify the charge. How do we determine the charge of iron? Again, we're going to do a little bit of algebra. Now, let's go back. This is called hydroxide ion. What is the charge on hydroxide ion? You can always go back and check that. The hydroxide ion has a charge of negative 1. If we have a stability that has that negative 1, let's go back. No, sorry, let's go forward. So what that means is that there are two atoms. So it means that there is one OH minus and another there's OH minus. So what it means there are two of them here to give us this. And for you to balance these two, you need how many of these? You just need two of these two. What it means is that the charge of this has to be two plus for that to be balanced. So then we know the charge has to be two plus. The charge has to be two plus, and then we name it. We now go. So it's gonna we're not gonna say as usual. This is copper. It's going to come first. Copper. But what's the charge? 2. You have to put it in parentheses as the case may be. And the name of this is what? Hydroxide. It is called copper hydroxide. Again, let's look at this. There's something here. We look at ion again. Ion is a variable charge. But look at sulfate. Sulfate. SO4 is called sulfate. You can always look at it. For time, I'm not going to look at it. But this is called sulfate. But we don't know the charge of this guy, but the sulfate is always 2 minus. And we have three atoms. So we'll see. Sulfate is 2 minus. Another sulfate. 2 minus. Another sulfate. Is 2 minus. If you add all these sulfates together, it's good. 6 minus. So, but. We already have how many atoms here? We already have two atoms here already. So what it means is that we have. We need a total of six, but we have six here. So it simply means is that the total charge on this guy has to be six, but there are already two atoms. So what do we do? What you simply do is to figure out what that charge will be. So you have two atoms already. So what it means is that, let's write it, Fe. We don't know what it is. Fe. There are two of them. But you need two, t t if two people shares a charge of six, what it means, one of them is going to charge of three plus and 3 plus. That's exactly what it means. So this has to be 6 plus. And in between the two of them, they have to share 3 by 3. So what it means is that the charge on this ion is going to be what? Plus 3. And then we go back and name it. Name it now. That becomes ion. The charge is 3. Having the determined that 3. The name of this cation is called sulfate. Ion 3. Sulfate. Now, we're not, we're not going to do the exact opposite of what we did before. We're going to be writing the formulas of this compound from DNA. So here we have potassium. Again, potassium is in group 1. And in fact, this will be the last solution and the last slide. Potassium is in group 1. So the charge is going to be 1 plus. What about nitrate? We did nitrate earlier. Nitrate has a charge of minus 1, and this is the formula. Again, they're going to swap charges as usual. If this one goes to this one, this one is one. So what do we do? If one is to one. We just can't, we just bring, we just remove the signs and bring down the formula. So this is going to be the formula, potassium nitrate. Now, what about calcium phosphate? Again, calcium is in group two, has to be two plus. Phosphate is what? 
in group 3 has to be 3 minus. What are we going to do? The charges are not equal, so we have to swap them. So we're going to swap this guy. So let me use a different color. So I'm going to take this 3 and give it to sodium. And give it to calcium, sorry. And then take this 2 and give it to phosphorus. That's what we're going to do. So if we do that, what are we going to have? So it's going to be calcium. We we'll get the 3 from this guy, phosphate. And then since phosphate now is going to have more than one, uh, it's going to have more than one, there, there will be more than one phosphate ion here. So what do we do? Remember the rule. You're going to put what? A parenthesis. So it's going to be PO4. Because this is one entity. You don't want to make it confusing. If you don't put this bracket, it just means the PO4 2. That will be too confusing. So we're going to put 2 here. And this becomes the correct formula of calcium phosphate. Now let's go to aluminum chloride. chloride. Aluminum again, aluminum is in group 3, it also has the charge of plus 3. If you look at that your table again, chloride has a charge of plus 1, and the formula is ClO3. <coughs> Excuse me, minus. So this is chloride. Again, the charges are not equal, so we're going to swap the charges. Now chloride has 1 minus. This one is going to go to aluminum. Aluminum is going to take the one, whereas chloride is going to take the three from aluminum. If we do swap those charges, what is it going to be? It is aluminum will be Al1. We don't put the one. And then we now have ClO3 that is taking three. It's more than one. What will you do? You have to put parentheses three. And this is the correct formula for aluminum chloride. The last but not the least, again, Ion 3 carbonate. Ion here is uh, the metals with variable charge. <coughs> you find out the ion here has a 3 plus charge. What about carbonate? Carbonate is CO3 2 minus. It has a 2 minus charge. Again, what do we do? The best thing I test is swap the sign. So we're going to take these two and give two ion. And ion will give the 3 to carbonate. So it's, it's going to be ion takes 2 from here. And then carbonate takes what? But since we are now talking about more than three, more than one polyatomic ion, what do you do? Parenthesis CO3. It is getting three from carbon. So this is the correct formula for ion three carbonate. So it has been an interesting ride in recording this class. Um, the nomenclature of these ionic compounds are very interesting. I will advise you to practice more on your, on your own. Look at the worksheet and try to solve more problems. As usual, if you encounter any problem, do not hesitate to contact me through the usual channels or come to my office. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.